Amen. It's good to be back on this end of the pulpit. Just, uh, we have a rotation. We get to take turns and hear from one another. And, of course, we've been through this whole month of sanctification. And you've heard the message after message. I hope you've been blessed by those. And most importantly, I hope you, you've allowed the Word of God to work and move within your life and show you how you can be more sanctified, letting, allowing the Spirit of God, the Word of God, to take and shape your life as He will. So we've uh, had for our theme for the month is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And so as we conclude the month and we'll begin uh, the new theme for October, uh, I'll read this 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 for you. It says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's a really fitting verse. You'll be sanctified wholly, and then it describes every aspect of our life, spirit, soul, body, through and through. We want to be sanctified and preserved blameless, blameless unto the coming of Christ. Today, our verse is going to come from Revelation. We're going to go to chapter 5, actually two verses, verses 9 and 10. So I'd like, if you would, turn to that for, uh, with me and uh, probably also put it on the screen. And then if you would, please stand and we'll read it together. Revelations 5, verses 9 and 10. I'll give you just a moment. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests. If you would please, we'll, oh sorry, and we shall reign on the earth. Can't want to forget that part. We would bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, we ask you, God, to bless our reading of your word, our, our looking just into what you have to say to us through it and its application to our lives. Lord, that we would continue to receive that sanctification that we need within us through and through. And uh, Lord, we pray these things in the blessed name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for that. So, question. Here the Bible tells us that we're we're going to all sing a song. There's a song that's going to be sung and be sung by the redeemed. So we first may ask, well, why a song? Why is it going to be something that's going to be sung? And why is it going to be sung by the redeemed? You know, we had the uh, Bible study not that many weeks ago that Bill Adams taught on music and um, gave a breakdown on the purpose of music and what's proper music and, and just how to, to uh, understand it as a form of worship and so forth. And personally... I consider song to be the highest form of communication. That's the way I see it. I know this isn't a theological statement. Uh, it's just my personal view. Of course, uh, love is best expressed by sacrificial giving, and that is a theological statement. But if you want to communicate that love by a description, I see song as the best way to infuse the words with the emotions they inspire. I really think that's a, a, a great way of doing that. And maybe I'd say the best way to do that. Right. None of it has bearing, though, without the words. All the music you may compose or whatever, without the words in terms of what God is communicating or giving us to communicate and how we communicate it, the words are what give it all bearing. When God left us the, the hymnal of the Bible, that would be the book of Psalms, he only left us the lyrics. Because the words are what is God-inspired, the music isn't. The music itself is only a way in which we use our gifts, whatever that we have, the gifts we have given, been given by God, to express those lyrics, which is why music always falls short and is ephemeral at best. It just comes and goes. You have the hit and it goes away and then you have the next one. Everybody has to write the newest next, next thing. Styles change. All these things change. Music comes and goes. But the words, they have been here. They will continue to be here. They will not change. It's even true for gospel music. Songs come and go. That's right. But when we combine the words of truth with all the gifts of expression that God gives to us, it communicates truth with the emotions that the words of truth inspire. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I'll read a couple of Psalms just as an example. So Psalms 40, verse 3. I really like some of these um, in terms of just talking about that gift God's given to express and how we express it. So it says, And 
He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. He hath put a new song in my mouth. I can just think of whatever the psalmist had gone through, whatever had happened and come out in the end. It's like, man, I have something new to sing about. It's something new that God has done in my life, and I, I have to tell it. I'm going to tell it in the very best way I can express it. Psalms 59, 16 to 17. But I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. So we hear the power of these words, and we can almost hear the music, the emotion through the music that it would have been, been composed with it to carry that thought forward all these things he's looking for and how he sees God as his strength and his defense and his mercy that he wants to sing about, all these things he wants to communicate. So I find there's kind of a, a hierarchy, if you will, of communication methods, right? You have all these different ways to communicate. Even now we have more, but uh, you have the written word, the spoken word. Written is, has very limits. You can read it and you can try to interpret it and not really quite understand it. Text is probably the very worst. You send a text and you think it saying one thing and somebody reads it totally differently. So fortunately, you got some emotion, emotion civil faces to put in there. I'm trying to be, I'm smiling here or I'm sad here or whatever it is. I kind of help express it because you can't have that visual. And then you have the spoken word, which is like we would do now, but especially now if you can see somebody, you can see their, their facial expressions, their hand gestures and so forth. You can read the person a whole lot better. We have prose and poetry and then maybe even you could say I don't know if this is all quite the order everybody would put, but I'll just put it prose and then poetry, a little more expressive, and then you have rap, and then you have song, where you put melody to the words, not just rhythm, so rap creates the rhythm. And then song with accompaniment, or any of these things with an accompaniment. When you add the chords and rhythm and coordination with the harmony and the ti timing, it brings all the multiple elements together into one, what we call a symphony, and becomes something truly beautiful. We might even say something heavenly. But when we put the emphasis, if we should, put it on the music over the message and just focus on the music alone, then the artist and the artistry becomes worshipped. We start to focus on that instead of the words. And often the, the Holy Spirit is, is, we think of emotion and we feel the emotion, we start to attribute it to the Holy Spirit and, it, and then we can actually l be moved away from what the Word of God says and take our focus off of those things and start getting wrapped up into the emotion. And that can be a problem. It's actually a growing problem among churches today. We've seen it, I see it continually uh, happening within uh, Christendom. And this is why John doesn't just describe song, but the song of the redeemed, specifically. It's not just music. He's saying, hey, there's a song, and we can all sing it, let's all just jump in. The song of the redeemed, they have a special message to convey. And that's what we want to look at. So we have an example. Several examples, but I want to focus on one. This is an example that we have from Moses. After the Israelites were delivered from captivity in Egypt. So I'm going to read a lengthy section, but it's a song. The lyrics to a song. A song written by Moses, and it's found in Exodus 15. And I'm just going to read through. 1 to 21. Of course, you know the setting. They just got delivered out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. And so here it is. Then sang Moses... And the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord. Now, where it says Lord, I said I wouldn't comment, so I'm just going to make one, one oh, <laughs> excuse here. The Lord, when it says Lord in bold letters, we know that's the word Yahweh. And it's because he's talking about the name, I'm going to say Yahweh just for the sake of you hearing it as a name instead of just a title, all right? So bear with me as I do it. And spake, saying, I will sing unto Yahweh, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown in the sea. The Lord is, Yahweh is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. So I had to use that to get that verse across. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains are all drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. 
In the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people, which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. And then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By thy greatness of mine arm, they shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, till thy people pass over, which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of mine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hand have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. So here's that song. You can see all the things that he's putting in there to describe the deliverance that has taken place in singing this with the people. And it was the congregation that was joining in and singing, them, singing it with them. And so you can see it wouldn't have been the same if it had just been music or whatever. He was telling a specific story about a specific event, about what God has done and who he is and what his name is. So it goes on back on with the narrative in verse 19. It says, For the horse of Pharaoh went into his chariots, and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters upon the sea, of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Now after this, Miriam, who is Moses' sister, repeats Moses' song. In the text, it only quotes the first line, but you can get the idea that he's saying that she goes back and they all start to repeat this song and sing it. So we can assume he, she did the whole thing, adding an instrument, the timbrel which would be like a little drum, like our, maybe our, um, our tambourine with the skin on the front. And then the women, they joined in, and they joined in at a dance. So I'll read it for 20 and 21. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, saying, Sing ye, un, sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses' song and the words of that song were so inspiring that they became an instant hit <clears throat> right then and there. Before long, it became a new dance craze. They were all out there doing it. All the women were doing the redemption dance right there in front of everyone. They were just singing that song. You know, Pharaoh and his chariots, right? The host of them, they were cast into the sea. His chosen captains, I don't know how they did it, but you know, it had to be something, right? And the depths covered them and they, they sank like a stone. How did they do that? They, What's, the, what's that dance? Yeah. So you think this stuff is new. It's not new. It's been around forever. I'm sure they were doing it back then. They all had tasted redemption. Every one of them. They all tasted it. They all wanted to sing this song. It wasn't somebody who was just hanging out on the shoreline when they got across the other side and he goes, hey, that looks like a neat one. I think I'll jump in and do that one. I haven't seen that one before. No, no one was joining in who didn't know what redemption was. The story, the lyrics was the inspiration for the song and the dance, not the other way around, okay? The story, the lyrics, they inspired the song, they inspired the dance. The song and the dance didn't inspire words. And many songs today, lyrics don't even make sense. You ever notice that? They just throw something in there randomly. It sounded good, we threw it in there. We didn't know what it was really talking about. <coughs> when a man, though, falls in love, he doesn't reveal his heart to his love via text. Let me just tell you all the ways I love you. And not if he really wants that to go anywhere, because I don't think it's going to go over too well. He writes it. He writes it down. He writes it, and he writes it in a sonnet. 
He sings it to her under the bedroom window at 4 a.m. Why? Because he can't help himself. There's nothing that makes us love more than receiving the love of Christ. Nothing inspires us more than that love. We're compelled by the greatest love of all. They're all in these stories, songs, whatever, books, movies have been made, all about trying to express some form of love. They can never outdo the gospel message. In many ways, they try to mimic it. Try to kind of repeat it some other way, taking God out of it, but it just can't do it. Because no matter what, no matter who you have laid down their life for somebody else, they're all human, just like you and me. You know, only one came from heaven to earth for our salvation. So, <clears throat> this greatest love, we want to express it in a way that not only tells the miraculous story, but does so in a way that represents its impact on our life and our soul. So we are told by John in Revelation, he received from Jesus Christ that there is a song of the redeemed. Now, we'll turn to Revelation 5, but I'll give, give a little introduction. So Revelation, as you know, it's a big book. A lot of people get all excited about the book and want to make that the first one on the list to read, but it should be the last one. It's like the final exam of the Bible. Revelation is divided into three sections, though. It says something. He's going to come and tell them what was, what is, and what is to come. Chapter, chapter 1 describes what was, talking about Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and taking the keys of death and hell. Chapter 2 to 3 describes what is, speaking to the seven churches of Asia. And then chapter 4 describes what is to come. So I'm not going to read chapter 4, but I'm going to give you a, a little overview. Overview. I was... It's set to set the stage for chapter 5. Um, so I have to read, though, first verse, chapter, verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, And after this I looked, John speaking, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. So this is right after he talked about the seven churches in Asia and the message that, that Jesus had for them. Then he says, Then after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee which things must be hereafter. So chapter 4 begins with John hearing the voice of a trumpet that calls him into God's throne room. Are you with me? Now, if you're, if it should be like, I mean, if we really understand this, I, I want to just kind of reiterate it a little bit, but so nobody misses the point here. John heard a voice like the sound of a trumpet and is caught up into heaven before God's throne room. Isn't this describing the blessed hope and our expectation today to hear that trumpet sound and be caught up into heaven so here's where John finds himself he's there and he's in God's throne room before his royal court sets the stage and describes this whole thing here's the throne and all these things that it specifically says there is the throne and there's one sitting on the throne whose description is uh, described as someone who is glorious and with him is the symbol of Yahweh's covenant, the rainbow over the people, so letting us know this is Yahweh on the throne. And around his throne there are 24 additional thrones upon which sit 24 elders, and they're all crowned with crowns because they are co-reigners with him, as it says, they will reign with him um, as priests and kings. And um, there are also four creatures, heavenly beings, whose description resembles the creatures on the earth described in the creation story. It's talking about a lion, um, a uh, bull, a man, and an eagle, describing animals like we would see on the earth during the creation story. It also uh, symbolizes, or uh, sorry, references to us, or brings to our mind Isaiah 6, 3, where we see similar beings described, okay? And, and we're, there, we're there proclaiming God's glory that fills the earth. So we get this idea of these creatures praising God, uh, day and night, that's what it says that they do, and it gives us a picture of all creation, all creation giving glory to God. Here we are, in heaven. We're seeing all creation giving glory to God. And isn't that true of creation, that it does this? Uh, Romans 1.20 tells us that creation declares God's eternal power in Godhead, even the creation that we see. And so here he is in heaven. He's seeing this in, this in his royal throne room. And as these creatures cry, holy, 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 and so forth, the 24 elders, they fall down, they worship before the throne, they glorify him too. So in this throne room, God has given glory for his creative power. 
give him glory for his creative power, as opposed to the throne rooms of the world that we have around us today, or that have all existed on the earth, where the person who sat on that throne is always given glory for their destructive power, their ability to conquest, to conquer, to take over, to rule, to dominate. But God has given glory for his creative power. And as of yet, in all this glorious assembly, is there anybody singing? Uh, still not yet. Still not singing. So let's go to Revelation chapter 5, okay? It says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. A, a scroll, really. A book being a scroll of the time. It's actually a, an epistograph, if you wanted to have the term. It's a parchment written on both sides and was often used in official business. So it's written on the front and written on the back. Scrolls were rolled up, and they would be sealed with seals. And the only person who could break the seal was somebody who had the proper authority to open that seal. And so here it was, sealed off with seven of them. It says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? It's like, who is worthy? The angel himself is powerful, speaks with a long, strong voice of authority, and yet he looks for somebody else to open the scroll because he himself won't do it. No man in heaven, nor in earth, it says in verse 3, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So the search is made. It's made, but to no avail. They looked in the heaven. If it were today, they may search up all the way to those poor souls trapped in the space station, you know, can you help us? And they're like, no, we're stuck up here. Oh, can you open the pod bay door? No. Okay. They searched the entire earth for someone to open it. So in the heavens, they couldn't find it. In the earth, they searched there. If they had searched again today, well, then maybe they're looking to Bill Gates, George Soros, the Pope, maybe even a lot of pastors. They probably wouldn't even want it opened. And we don't want the sealed judgments opened up. I think we're okay as we are. If our search was made among our dear seasoned saints, there still wouldn't be anybody who would be able to open it. So, they looked in the earth, in the earth, in the grave, among all who had ever lived since the creation of all the earth. If the search could have been done to include people that we would know, they would have looked, found Buddha, they would have found Muhammad, they wouldn't have been able to open it. They would have found Abraham, David, and some of the apostles, they wouldn't have been able to open it either. If they had searched any of us today, no one would be able to open it. No one has hands clean enough to open it, to even touch it. No one has eyes clean enough to look at it, it said. Paul describes the state of man in this way in Romans 7, 21 to 24. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So we have this dichotomy of things. We're trying to do good, we want to do good, but we have a nature. That nature is sin. That sin prevents us from opening those judgments. It says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, my soul, spirit, I, spiritually, I want to do these things, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, he cries, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And this is where we all reside. Oh, wretched man that I am, we can all say it. You know, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is our pain and agony every day. This should be what's driving us every day to seek God. Amen. We're all in need of redemption from our sins. So in verse 4, back in, in Revelation, it says, John says, And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. John wept much. There is a word in the Greek which means to cry silently, you know, to just kind of sniffle a little bit about something, be a little upset about it. But that's not the word it's used here. The word he uses means to bewail and to lament. John is sobbing. He is sobbing uncontrollably. God has called him up into heaven to reveal himself to John and his will. But they've reached an impasse. No one's able to open the scroll or even to look at it. He's sobbing. He's there, right there. 
Those who love God love his will, correct? We want to know his will so that we may know God more and to perform his will because we love it, right? So imagine John's anguish as his vision stops right there at this critical moment. He's up there, everything is happening, seeing all these things that he's seeing. The scroll is present to all that are there, but no one's able to open it. That'd be one thing, but I would say there's even more. God's will now seemingly lies in jeopardy. Because without anyone worthy to open the scroll, there is no way to reveal and advance God's righteousness and to exec execute his redemptive work on the earth. So he's there, he's, what are we going to do? And he's crying bitterly, bitterly uh, to see something, needing something, a solution to the problem. So can you, can you identify with that? When you look at all the pain and the suffering in the world around you, do you ever ask, God, when will your righteousness prevail? You see all this going on. When you see all the injustice and wickedness seemingly performed without restraint, governments and empires destroying their own nations, economies, and the people who they, they've already enslaved just so they can gain more power to do more wickedness, do you ever wonder, God, when are you going to judge those who oppose your people and oppose your will? It's painful to watch it all. And sit here and see it. The other Sunday, I got choked up singing Daystar. I was in the middle of the song. I was like, <clears throat> you know, I, I didn't weep too well, but I maybe, you know, got a little watery, <laughs> teary-eyed. So it was that verse that says, The Lord, I see the world is dying, wounded by the master of deceit, yeah. groping in the darkness, yeah. haunted by the years of past defeat. And I thought of all those who need to know the grace of God, and it, it just pained me to see what I know is happening and I know is going to just get worse and worse on this earth as time ticks away towards God's return. So we long for God's righteousness, and we hate to see the people suffer. So I imagine John standing there where God's judgment, he's right there in the place where God's judgment is issued forth to correct all the wrongs on the earth. All they need to do is open that scroll, and there's no one to do it because Everybody has sinned. Everybody has sinned. So Romans 8, 19 to 23. I'm going to read this. It describes it well. It says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. This earnest expectation that we have within us, waiting for the ability to become transformed into the image of God, if we say it that way. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. We were all subject to the same uh, sinful nature. It says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And this is what we're waiting for, to be delivered. Now, of course, in today's day, we have Christ, and we, have, we understand that redemption power. So now we can look at it a little bit differently. So it says, in verse 22, for we know that the whole world, I'm sorry, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So all of creation is saying is groaning and travailing in pain together until now. So we are, we are the creature made subject to vanity. Vanity meaning sinful, sinfulness. Our sins affects the whole creation though. When sin entered into the world, it didn't just affect us, it affected the whole world. All of creation. That includes the fish, the birds, the mammals, the trees, the flowers, the grain they produce, the fruits, whatever. They're all out of harmony. <clears throat> they're no longer a symphony, but a cacophony. You know, symphony is the opposite, the ant antonym. Cacophony. You know when the uh, orchestra is warming up before the concert? You know, you hear everybody's playing all different parts all at the same time. They haven't tuned their instruments yet. They're all just making different noise. Nobody bought a ticket to listen to that, right? That's just a total cacophony. But we come in, we want to see it all transform. We want to see that take place where they, they do they hear all that. They're all warming up. They're all doing their thing. Then the conductor comes out. Everybody's tuned. They all come to the same notes, the same center of reference. And then they all play together in harmony. And that's where it becomes beautiful. That's what people are paying for. So it's all because of our sin. Today we have, I, I can just go on and list about, I've I, I got to say a few things. Grains that many people can no longer eat. I, I can't eat gluten, you know. This, you know, Why? They say because we've just changed it too much. We just kept modifying it. The other day we went to buy food for the dog and it, it, 
it had grain in it and the dog got sick and I went to the, to the, vet, the, uh, the feed sales place where we buy the food and I was like, the dog can't eat grain. She's like, yeah, that, that happens. I was like, you're kidding me, I mean, a dog. So anyway, can't eat it anymore. The body doesn't recognize it as it was when it was created, when God created it. Plastics, plastics, plastics are being found at a cellular level inside bodies, I mean goodness. We have medical interventions that alter God's God-given DNA, alter it. We have, we're creating super germs. We can't even cure with antibiotics anymore. Splicing animals with humans together to create pathogens that never existed before, why? For our safety, I, I don't understand. We're splicing genes with dream, genes to create new life forms so we can patent and say, look what I did. And I don't think we know all that's going on. Okay. But I do know that the whole world, the whole creation, as it says, groaneth and travaileth in pain together. That we can see. You know, at our prayer meeting last Friday, it reveals it too. We had numerous prayer requests for those with cancer, even beloved brothers and sisters in their own church or those in their family directly. We had numerous prayers requests for those with mental illnesses, um, for those with drug addictions. We groan and travail and pain together with the rest of creation. All this begins with sin. There's no saving the whale or saving the trees without first saving the soul. So Paul continues in 23, he says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, meaning to know the redemption of the body. So even we, he's saying this in the New Testament day, as a born-again believer, he's saying we ourselves still, we have this groaning within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. We're still waiting for something yet. Even though we have that transformation taking place in our lives, we have redemption of the Spirit, we're still waiting for that day when we receive that glorified body and all sin is removed. So we still need, the earth needs redemption. So here we are in God's throne room again. John laments because the scroll cannot be opened to correct all these wrongs, to heal the broken, to save the soul. But then, then something amazing happens, something miraculous happens in, in verse 5. It says, And one of the elders said, saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Amen. Someone has been found worthy. As a descendant of Judah and John, we know this, that he is a man. You can't be a descendant of Judah and John unless you're a human being. And as a man of the Israeli loyal, royal line as well, to be of Judah and John. He is also described as a lion, giving us the character of a fierce conqueror. So here's this man of this royal line, lion with the character of a fierce con conqueror. <clears throat> John looks to see who this is, and it says in verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of all of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Looking for one thing, he looks over and there's this Instead of a lion, he sees a sacrificial lamb. And much of the contrast, as it is to say that the royal court is worshiping God for his creative power instead of destructive power, now we also see this, this fierceness of this, of this lion is demonstrated to us in the nature of this sacrificial lamb. Only God would do this. So uh, verse 6, second part. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So John describes this lamb as having all power, seven horn, horns or dominion, and seven eyes, omniscience, and possessing the fullness of God's spirit. So though he has all dominion, he knows all deeds of man. If he knows all deeds of man, what does he know? He knows all the sins of man. And in spite of all this, and having all the fullness of the Godhead, yet he has laid down his life for every one of us. That's what he has done. And he came in verse 7, this lamb came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb. All creation now turns and worships the lamb as God. Why? Because his sacrificial blood was payment for all our sins. You know, redemption, as we're talking about being redeemed, redemption is a financial term. It means to buy back, to buy back. You redeem whatever you put on loan for collateral. You buy it back. 
or to free from captivity by paying a ransom. You can redeem them back by paying a ransom to free somebody who's been captive. And because he redeemed us from the captivity of sin and paid us for the penalty of death, he's able to give us the power to be transformed into his image, which means to redeem us from our sinful state, to become his priests and kings in his royal court. For those who accept him and worship him, he cleanses us and sanctifies us, which is what we've been talking about so much throughout this month. He sets us apart for his will. Uh, second part of verse 8. Having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors or fragrances, which are the prayers of the saints. So it's telling us, keep praying, church, keep praying. They are not lost. Prayers are not dismissed. Every prayer is stored up in heaven. So now here is where we see the work of Christ in action across creation as we go back to our, our main verse. If we go all the way down, we're now at verses 9 and 10. And they sung a new song. So here we have the four and twenty elders bowing down. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So here is their song and what they're singing. They're singing of what? They're singing of their redemption, of them being in this low state waiting for their say execution in a sense to be paying the price for the sin and instead of that God redeems them and sets them up as priests and kings they have a song to sing and they're going to sing it they're not going to just talk about it so here is where we see those in verse 24 uh, who they represent it says that they are redeemed out of every kindred that'd be every race every tongue which means every language and every people and nation they're all redeemed by Jesus' blood coming out from among the people now, when the redeemed began to sing this new song, they are joined. We saw what happened with Moses. And Moses began to sing, and then the congregation, and then we said Miriam starts to sing, and then the, the women start to sing. We see this start to bring everything in together. Everyone starts to come into harmony. All the little elements that were maybe out of order and in cacophony are now coming into harmony and symphony, all starting with this redemption of what's brought to us by the, by the one who was able to open those seals. They're joined first by the heavenly host, verses 11 and 12. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10 thousands. You can start to do the math, but then he goes on. And thousands of thousands. I think we get the idea that, you know, let's just not even try to number these people. There's just so many angels there. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. They're joining in the chorus. Amen. Then every creature on earth joins in. It says in verse 30, it says it. And every creature which is in heaven. We talked about they searched in heaven. And on the earth. We talked about how they searched in the earth. And under the earth. We talked about how they searched under the earth. And he says, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, which I heard. I'm sorry, which, uh, sorry, heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Then the four beasts, you're getting ahead of the four beasts. And then the four beasts, they finished it off. It says the four beasts said, Amen. Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down again. They fell down and they worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. You can hear this whole thing coming all back in to complete what God created. Can you imagine being at that point in our life and seeing all that anguish, all that pain, all that torment, all our, our prayers that we've been longing for and desire that we see and to see it all finally, finally happen and everything restored back into harmony with God. Wow. Wow. Amen. So I'm, we're at the end. I'm, I'm going to close. Let me add, Jesus' blood is for everyone. Everyone. No matter what, who you are, no matter what you've done, the blood is for everyone. He has the power to redeem you. His blood will cover your sins and all of them. 1 Peter 4, 8 is a verse I like to share. I really like this one. It says, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. It says, it tells us why. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. It didn't say charity shall cover some 
sins. It doesn't say charity shall cover a lot of sins, but the multitude. If you talk about how it's phrased, the multitude means the sum, all of it. Charity will cover it all. Whatever debt was owed, the blood will cover it. Whatever needed, the price needed to pay, be paid for that redemption, the blood will cover it, all of it. Everything you have committed, we are free from every force that once bound us, that ever oppressed us, that possessed us, that opposed us. All sin, all sin is covered by the blood. All demonic forces are subject to Christ who lives within us as well. It's not God's will that you sin so that you might testify of the power of grace, it says. Right? We don't want to say, well, if that's the case, then the more I sin, the more I can testify of the power of grace. No, it says, God forbid, but it is God's will that sinners are saved so that they may testify of Christ's mercy and the power to save. So we're not looking to sin to, to receive more grace, but no matter what the sin is, God will use that to testify of the power of his blood to cover it. 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 16. Last verse. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Everybody should accept it as fact. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul's writing and he says, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. What he's saying here is, here's the facts. Here's the facts. Jesus came to save sinners. He didn't come to comfort us in our sins. He came to deliver us out of our sins. He doesn't want to say, hey, just go, oh, it's just going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You're okay. I'm okay. No, he came to deliver us out of those sins. But then he adds, of whom I am chief. Of whom I am chief. Here, Paul uses his own sins as an example to us. He's saying, look at mine. Look at mine. If you think that you are bad, look at me. That's basically what he's saying. He says, for he reasoned that because he opposed God. If you looked at his testimony, which is laid out in Acts in a couple of places, it says because of his, his testimony, he opposed God himself and persecuted God's saints, the believers, to the point of their death. And so he says he's more of a sinner than anyone else. Look what I did. I have, I, there's nobody who fought God more than I could have fought God. I mean, you may be persecuting people too, but mostly we're talking about what? We're talking about all the vices of life that we did and things that we did to one another or did to ourselves and so forth. We're not looking at it quite the same way. We don't see it as he, but he was like, he was directly assaulting God's kingdom and his people. That's what he says. So he says he's more a sinner than anyone else. Yet, yet, God saved him and he saved him to testify of the mercy of Jesus Christ. He says, if God will save me, then he can save you too. You may think that your sin is too great, that your addiction is too great, that your mental illness or other diagnosis is too great, but Christ stands ready to redeem you. His blood is sufficient to do so. The greater the sin, the greater the witness you become to Jesus and to his redeeming power. There's a passage actually in the Old Testament, I'll just, in closing reference, it says if an animal dies, and falls and touches your whatever. Your dog died and fell on your bed. Your bed's now unclean. You've got to get rid of the bed. Fell on your carpet. Carpet's unclean. You've got to get rid of it. Fell on your clothes, your pottery, or whatever it is you had. You know, your vessels. You've got to get rid of them. It says, but if an animal dies and falls into the spring where the living water comes out, it, the, the dead does not defile the living water. And what it's saying is that in, if we would take it and apply it today, the source of life is Christ. And all the dead things being as bad as they may be and the way we look at them, the way we understand how, how horrific they are and how they defile everything that they touch, yet the spirit of the living God moving from with the source of Christ out is sufficient Nothing can defile it. Nothing. It instead cleanses everything that it touches. And that's how, that is how, no matter how bad that sin may be, the redemptive power of Christ is only going to get more glory because he's able to overcome it. We simply have to acknowledge him 
and his power and yield all those things back to him and accept that covering for our, our souls. Amen, church. God bless you. God bless you.